Good evening and welcome. Tonight we'll be going over the history and geography of Turkmenistan. I'll do geography, then history, and then we'll flip through this book and look at some of the very interesting pictures of Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan turned out to be one of those countries that I started researching and then kept researching and kept researching, reading more and more about it, and just like falling into rabbit holes of research. So I have just like way too much information in my head, so um, I, I might catch myself just like going off on random tangents about certain aspects of Turkmenistan's history. Apologies for that if that happens. Because um, usually when I do that, I get really loud and I talk too fast because I get really excited. So, apologies in advance if that happens. I'll try to contain myself about Turkmenistan. It's a very, um, I don't even have the words to describe this country. Um, I don't want to say bizarre. I don't want to say, uh, it's different. It's different. So, let's go over geography first. So, there are a couple of interesting geographic features in Turkmenistan. Uh, but first, let me show you the borders. As you can see, we are in Central Asia. And up here, we are bordering Kazakhstan. We have this border with Uzbekistan. It's a pretty long border. We'll talk about it. We have a border down here with Afghanistan. And we have a border here with Iran. And definitely what makes this country pretty different from all of its neighbors is that it doesn't really have like a, a mountainous zone like um you know Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan over here are crazy mountainous. Uzbekistan has a whole like mountain section. Turkmenistan really doesn't. Overall it is an incredibly flat country. There are some mountains over here the Kopitak Mountains. They, I mean, they're big, but compared to everything happening over here, down here in Afghanistan, it's like nothing. The capital city of Ashgabat is also located in this region over here. The desert area of Turkmenistan is known as the Karakum in English, and the Karakum in the Turkish languages that are spoken in this area, which means black. It's the Black Desert. It is overall incredibly flat. There are some parts that are actually like sandy desert, like when you picture a desert. It looks like that. And um, it's, it's a pretty big one, pretty much as far as the eye can see. So um, Turkmenistan has done a couple of things to try to combat um, the, the really inhospitable desert landscape. So we have the Amudarya River that flows down from the Aral Sea up here and makes up this whole border and then it comes down through here. This is definitely the longest river in Turkmenistan and it uh, flows out of the Aral Sea like I said. It was pretty much diverted by the Soviets and they very nearly dried out the Aral Sea. But you can see the, the green that's come out of that. Um, irrigation, things like that. There are also other little pockets of green you can see on this map that comes from the Karakum Canal. You know, the Soviets love their projects, right? And, um, for the most part, it's cotton that's grown in this area. Um, there's also a lot of natural gas in this area, and oil in this area. So the Soviets took advantage of that, of course. And there is one place they were mining gas near Derwezi, you can see right here, where um, some gas leaked out of the ground. So they decided to just burn it, thinking it would go out in a few days. But it has been burning since like the late 1950s, early 1960s. It's still going strong. And it's really bizarre. It's... I mean, it's at a place where there's just flat desert as far as the eye can see, and then there's a perfect circle in the ground, and there's just fire bursting out of it. You know, it's a gas fire, so it's crazy looking. It's intense. So it's nicknamed the Gate to Hell. It's pretty much like a, a touristy spot. I'm sure when I'm reading Atlas Obscura, when we get to this part of Asia, there'll definitely be a huge page about it, because it is bizarre. And there is a picture in this book I can show you. Um, 
it's just one of the weird things about Turkmenistan. It's, um, I, I don't think the people of Turkmenistan are particularly proud of it, but it's like the one big tourist thing to see in Turkmenistan. Otherwise, the big geographic feature would be its coastline with the Caspian Sea. You can see all over here. The Caspian Sea is the world's largest inland body of water, and it, um, you know, you'd really think that uh, a long seacoast like this, you get lots of beaches and stuff, but that's not really what Turkmenistan culture is about. Um, let me describe it to you. So, um, I guess I'll go into history at this point because that makes the most sense. So, the Turkmen history goes back a very long time, and they have a very long tradition of living a nomadic lifestyle, living in yurts, herding goats, and just kind of sticking to themselves, and if they're ever attacked or threatened, they will fight back. The, the Turkmen were considered like the more violent of the nomads over here compared to like the Uzbeks, Tajiks. Um, they, they would fight back the hardest. They were the most territorial, I suppose. In ancient history, this area is part of the Achaemenid Empire, and the people who would become the Turkmen people were originally the Oguz people, coming in from the east over here, and they were a Turkish people, like I said. It's a Turkish family language. They came in at about the 8th century CE, and when Islam came into the area and they accepted Islam, that's when they became the Turkmen. And that's pretty much how it was for quite a long time. You know, they just stuck to their their herding, their nomadic lifestyle, living in yurts so they could easily move around. The um, only one thing that really put this area on the map was the Silk Road, which was a path that traveled from China to Venice, Italy. There were quite a lot of stops this area of Turkmenistan, the most famous being Merv, which I believe is located around here near the city of what's now Mary. Um, but that was pretty much it. And um, in the fifth, the, sorry, the 13th century, the Mongols came and burned it all down. So it's all the cities that still exist are ruins. You know, that's nothing like it was before. The Mongols came through and destroyed everything. And um, as the people were trying to rebuild what little they already had. By the 16th century, the Uzbeks came in and started dominating this area. By then, they were ruled by um, Timur the Great, or Tamerlane, who was the grandson of Genghis Khan, right? Yeah, grandson. I don't know why I'm doubting myself. I know he is, or was. Um, so he got the itch to conquer, so he came into this area and it came under the control of two different khanates that came out of what's now Uzbekistan. They were the Kiva and the Bukhara khanates. The Turkmen did not really like this. They fought back a lot, but the khanates were a lot stronger than, you know, nomads and yurts, right? Um, but eventually there was one battle in 1855 where the Kiva empire was encroaching on their land. They fought back and the Turkmen's actually won. One of the few, like, national pride moments for the Turkmen. But as that weekend was replaced by the Russians, by the 19th century, the Russians started to come into the area. And, of course, they were like, not again. We're going to fight back against you guys. And at one point, there was a huge battle known as the Battle of Gokutepe. You can see right here, Gokutepe, where the... The Turkmen's faced a very crushing defeat against the Russians, and it was like the beginning of the end of their regular way of life and the beginning of Russian control. It's um, that that day of that battle is kind of like a holiday. It's like a day of mourning in Turkmenistan. So it came under Russian control. It was like annexed by Russia, basically. But then in 1916, the um, czarist government collapses during the Bolshevik Revolution, and this area was just left alone. You know, all the Russians pulled out to either fight for or against the revolution up in, you know, like St. Petersburg and up there. So they were left alone. So a lot of the nomadic people tried to come together to form their own 
kind of union, like not a country, like there weren't really even these lines back then. This was just like an area. There were no borders or anything. So the Turkmen, the Uzbeks, the Tajiks, you know, a couple of ethnic groups tried to come together to make something. It never really fully realized it kind of did, but it also kind of didn't. By the early 1920s, the Bolsheviks came in and said, this is still our land, right? And the Turkmen's were like, no, you guys left. Like, we're trying to make our own thing. The Bolsheviks said, too bad. They came back in. And in 1924, they established the Turkmen Soviet Socialist Republic, part of the USSR, right? And that's pretty much when these lines were drawn up. The Soviets were really concerned about making sure each ethnic group had their own place. So they decided this would be the Turkmen place. And like I said, there's not really a lot here. So they would um, try to establish collectivization of farming. And that's when they brought in the cotton industry just to try to make something out of nothing, basically. There's no profit in nomadic herding, right? So they attempted that. And the biggest news out of the Soviet era was in 1948 during the Ashgabat earthquake. It devastated the city completely. And um, hundreds of thousands of people lost their lives. Literally two-thirds of the city passed away during that earthquake. It's another national day of mourning and remembrance, and there's memorials for it and stuff in Ashgabat. Um, but that meant that the Soviets could rebuild. And so in came the Soviet architecture of the, like, you know, those big square apartment buildings and all of that. It was the opportunity for the Soviets to rebuild Ashgabat. Then, the Soviet Union starts to collapse. And Turkmenistan, you know, hasn't really been affected by the cruelties of the Soviet Union as other uh, republics within the Soviet Union have been. Because these people were just kind of left alone. Because like I said, they're pretty much were just nomads living in yurts herding goats, right? Being forced to try to live like a Soviet lifestyle, which, you know, kind of worked-ish. The Soviets never really knew what to do with this area, so they just kind of left them alone. So when the Soviet Union started to break up and fall apart, the people here were like, we kind of don't want that. Things are okay here. We're, you know, we have actual homes and cities and canals and industry. We've never had that before. Uh, you know, this, we're one of the few people that's getting the sweet end of the deal. So... On September 27th, 1991, Turkmenistan sort of reluctantly declared independence, just out of necessity. And the leader of the, um, the TSSR at the time became the president of what is now Turkmenistan, the independent country. And his name was Sapar Marat Nizov. And what a character. Where to begin with Nizov? So, if you know your North Korean history, Nizov and the Kims would get along so well. Basically the exact same personality. Um, where do you even begin with Nizov? Nizov wrote a book, a semi-autobiographical book about his life, along with like morals, like ways that the Turkmen people should follow, like, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's Anyway, he wrote this book, and he declared that everyone had to read it, it had to be studied in school, it was read in the morning in schools, um, like it was just as important as the Quran, um, in order to, um, what was it? in order to get your driver's license, you had to take a test on the book, because apparently if you understood the good morals of the book, you would be a good driver. Um, he built a lot of statues of himself. One in particular was made out of gold, and it would rotate, so it was always facing the sun. He decided that Ashgabat would be built entirely out of white marble. And not every building in Ashgabat is, but most of them are. It's like 80% of the buildings in Ashgabat are made out of white marble. And um, he strongly discouraged non-white cars from driving there. Um, what else did he do? He, <laughs> he outlawed dogs because he thought they were loud. Um, he wanted people to move into Ashgabat, but again, 
nomads herding goats living in their yurts. They're not really interested in that. So he closed all the hospitals all throughout the country except the ones in Ashgabat to try to force people to move there if they wanted health care. Like, he was just unchecked power. Of course, he eventually made himself president for life. You know, any election before that declaration was like, he was the only one on the ballot. It was illegal to run against him, basically. Um, but one policy that he implemented, which is, is not like a maniacal totalitarian dictator kind of thing, was that he declared complete neutrality and that Turkmenistan would not take sides in any um, political to-do at all. That they would be their own thing and they would not get involved in anything. They um, kind of had to get involved when the Taliban took over Afghanistan for the first time just to try to make sure there weren't too much extremist activity happening near the border, but, you know, they have absolutely no opinion on any political thing whatsoever. So, um, to me, that's like the most interesting thing that he did out of all of the absolutely bizarre things he implemented and uh, forced people to like address him as and all of that stuff. What a character, right? He passed away in 2006. Oh, that's another thing. He outlawed smoking because he had a heart condition, so he couldn't smoke, so if he couldn't smoke, nobody could smoke, so he eventually passed away from that heart condition. See, there's just like so many things. You see how I fell down a rabbit hole? I would just learn about all these different things. He outlawed dogs. Dogs. He made dogs illegal. Anyway. That, anyway. <laughs> he passed away in 2006. He did not name a successor, so there was some uh, panic, essentially. But his vice president stepped up and would eventually win the election that was held after then. His name's Gurban Guli Berdinu Hamidov. And he is also a character. He just pretty much picked up where Niazov left off and just, you know, he replaced a lot of the big statues of Niazov with statues of himself. He really loves his horses a lot. A lot. He loves his horses. He loves his horses. <laughs> They're like the big national pride of the country. Um, you know, the big, big statue in Ashgabat is him on one of his horses. You'll see a picture of him with one of his horses in this book. He loves his horses. A lot. It's his, like, first love is his horses and then probably his country or his ego and then his country. Um... He, um, because remember why I said Niazov didn't like cars that weren't white, he made it illegal to own a car that's not white in Ashgabat, so all the cars in Ashgabat are white. And, um, just another character, right? Another just completely eccentric dictator. However, um, he sort of started to disappear in, like, the... 2018, 2019s, he wasn't really seen a lot. There were rumors that he had passed away, but they weren't true. He's still alive today. Oh, and then 2020 happens. And um, the borders are closed by this point. So once COVID-19 happens, it's like perfect, like we're all set. And people were very, you know, not very pleased with that. That's not really good policy. Like, oh, we'll be fine is not a good a pandemic policy, and um, in the middle of 2020, he actually outlawed masks and would arrest people who wore masks and claim that they were causing, like, hysteria, basically, like, causing a panic among people. Like, if someone sees someone in a mask, they'll get freaked out. But not long after that, in, like, July 2020, Berdin Muhammadov decided to implement masks in Ashgabat. And he said it's because that summer was very dusty and people should protect themselves from the dust in the air by wearing masks this summer. And um, Turkmenistan has no recorded COVID-19 cases. It's one of those pristine countries. It's Turkmenistan and North Korea that just has not had COVID magically. So that's another interesting thing. But like I said, he was starting to kind of disappear from the public eye for quite a while. And in 
February 2022, he stepped down and handed the reins over to his son, Sardar Verdun Muhammadov. And they had an election, which Sardar won an election. So he became president in March 2022. So as I'm filming this, it is early April 2022. He hasn't even been in office for a month yet. So we don't know what this person's going to do to Turkmenistan. If he's going to continue the strange policies, if he's going to create new rules, um, we do not know. It's too early to say. He hasn't really done much of anything yet. So who knows what's going to happen to Turkmenistan next. It could literally be anything at this point. It's such a bizarre little hermit country, Central Asia. So different from all of its neighbors. So with that being said, Let's flip through the book and show you some pictures. So even though this book just came out, let me show you. This is one of like the brand new, 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 new books. This book was published in 2021 and it's already outdated. So, there's some sweet faces there. So here is the presidential palace in Ashgabat. You can see all the white marble and it's the Independence Day Parade some floats and lots of colors happening there. This is the Monument of Neutrality that declares that they are completely neutral. Some of the landscape there it says it's near Iran. And here's the Amudarya River. And here's the Caspian Sea. So you can see Turkmenistan right there. So here's the Karakum Desert. So just pretty dry and bare. Here it is, the Cape of Hell. Pretty wild, right? Like, those are people, big hole in the ground, with fire coming out of it. It's, it's pretty weird. So here's the Karakum Canal going through, irrigating what they can of the land. Here's some dromedary camels. Um, another important aspect for nomadic life in the area. Here's Ashgabat. You can see that Soviet architecture and all of the white. There's lots of these big parks and things that are pretty much empty. You can see all the white cars too. It's um, one of those cities where, um, well, for the country, you have to pay to get into the country. You can't just show up like you could any other country, right? Here's the ruins of Merv. That's all that's left of it. There's better pictures of it. You have to pay to enter the country and you cannot explore the city without a tour guide with you. It's it's very Pyongyang there. Um, everything's built just to um, make it look impressive, but not a lot of people actually live there. Here is a painting of nomadic life. People in their yurts just enjoying a peaceful life and wanting to be left alone, basically. The Parthian fortress of Nisa. I didn't mention them. The Parthians came into the area after the Achaemenids. And this is, um, isn't this another? Oh, this is Merv. This is some of what's left of Merv, apparently. There's a better picture. What's left of this village? The Mongols came in and destroyed it all, and that's all that they left behind once a flourishing Silk Road trading city. There's a Russian Empire in the 19th century. You can see that's where Turkmenistan is. And some Turkmen, it says, working in an office sometime between 1930 and 1940. They've got their back so they can count the money. Look at this. This is the... Um, golden statue of President Niyazov. And um, this is Gurbanguly Berdunohamidov. This is his 2017 inauguration ceremony, it says. There's the big gold statue of Niyazov, which, like I said, most of these were moved out of Ashgabat to like the outskirts of the city. Turkmenistan has a really beautiful flag. They, of course, have the Islamic green, the and stars and then they put in 
some designs. There'll be pictures later of the carpets that are woven in Turkmenistan. So they put some traditional patterns that are woven into their rugs on the flag. I think that's really neat. Same thing with Belarus too. I kind of did the same thing. It's really pretty. There's the presidential palace, all the white marble and beautifully laid out everything. And here's the big statue of Burdi Muhammadov on his horse. Yeah. Oh, there's someone casting a vote in an election. Oh, it's a parliamentary election, so it's not like a presidential election where it's just fake. Some money where Nizov is on every single bill. Some of the pipelines there for the gas. Pretty much how they fund having an entirely white marble city. There's a vineyard. It's nice. We've got a bunch of cotton and some cotton that's been picked. Oh, I just remembered another thing. Take a look at the caracal sheep here, though. When I'm talking about the sheep in their yards, that's what I'm talking about. Those are the sheep they would herd. So there's Bredunamidov in front of a library. Um, Niazov, another thing he did. See, there's just too many weird things that he did to remember. He changed the name of the days of the week in Turkmenistan to his name, and he changed all the months of the year to his name and his mother's name. There might be a statue in here of his mother. He really, really loved his mother. There's a ancient mosque from Merv. We've got the desert. Pretty much that's what it looks like. Here's the Aral Sea shrinking. Isn't that remarkable? All from like, not just like global warming, it mostly has to do with irrigation and um, just not as much water going in as they were taking out. It's pretty sad. It's radically changed so much of the environment there. There's another picture of the canal. And oh, here he is with his horse. So it's the Akalteka horses that he loves the most. And they are very beautiful horses. But he loves them so much. They're his favorite thing. You see how happy he is? He loves his horses so much. He wrote a book about the horses. Like he, he, he posted a video of him singing a song about the horses. He's thought to have hundreds of them. I'm telling you, he loves the horses. I can't stress that enough. Here's some little faces. They're very clearly like told to line up so I can take your picture. And they're like, what's a picture? <laughs> uh, this is showing the traditional Turkmen hats. They look very cozy. They look very warm. Here's a little family. That's a great little, there we go, little family picture. We've got some traditional clothes here and beautiful braided hair. We've got some legendary Turkmen statues there at the Independence Monument. And we've got a bazaar, which looks very Soviet, doesn't it? It looks like a, like a really weird supermarket more than a bazaar. Yeah, that's kind of not what you imagine when you think of like a, a bazaar, but oh well. Look at this guy in his hat. This is the Turkmenistan Broadcasting Center where they broadcast all their propaganda. Anyway, some more Ashgabat here. Check out all the white. We've got Nomads herding his goats. That's what I'm telling you. That's all these people want to do. <laughs> and more white marble. So, like, this is how the government wants them to live. And this is how they actually want to live. Pretty much. So that, that's wild. And here's a yurt. Which is one of my personal dreams. Like, I either want to live in an RV, a tiny home, or a yurt. Like, that's my dream. I want to live in just like a tiny compact space so much. I would love to have a yurt. Oh, they're learning geography in school. And this talks about the COVID response. These look at to protect against dust in the air. <laughs> that pesky dust. And some soldiers in a parade. Looks like they've got mics on so they can sing, I guess. 
Look at this mosque. That's beautiful. The Turkmenbashi Ruhi Mosque. The largest mosque in Central Asia. That's interesting. This is the mosque built for Burdu Muhammadov. Yeah, it's, he has his own mosque named after him. Of course he does. And these guys are praying at the, the mosque near the reconstructed mosque near Mer. And this pictures or this is a drawing of the battle of Goktepe. That um battle the Turkmen versus the Russians that the Turkmen were like destroyed at. Language chapters. This talks about what their language looks like. The Runama, that's the name of his book. This is a statue. It, it says it right here. Norma statue, the Runama. Every evening at 8 p.m. the cover opens and a recording plays a passage from the former president's book. Yeah, I'm telling you, this book is like a part of daily life. Ooh, look at this. This is a door to a, a mausoleum. So, so intricate. Beautiful, beautiful work. This is at the National Carpet Museum. Look at all the carpets on the wall. See the, the beautiful, beautiful designs there. And here they are. Um, are they making them or selling them? Oh no, it's just Nauru's. They're having a party. That's what they're doing. It's spring equinox holiday, Nauru's. They've got all their rugs out to celebrate. Here we go. This person is making a rug. All the little details in there. And um, she's making a carpet out of wool. Very, very traditional style there. And some beautiful Turkmen jewelry. Very, very pretty. This lady's selling some jewelry. And this is interesting. This is an asik or a woman's back pendant. It's really pretty. We've got, oh, this is the national poet, um, Maktunkuli Faragi. Um, and we have um, a famous novelist speaking with Diane Sawyer. His name is listen journalist Rakim Esenov. We've got um, there at the polling station, and look, she's got her copy of the Renama there. And let's see, oh, musicians playing, isn't that wonderful? That looks like a party, that looks like fun. A painting exhibition by Dirdi Bayramov. Lots of bicycles, old bicycle things. At this monument. This was built in 2020 to honor its bicycles. So I guess these bicycles just around this big globe with Turkmenistan being gigantic. <laughs> Look at this. This is like a hiking trail that was built by Niyazov. And um, as you can see, there's no shade. Part of it is this huge staircase. I think it's, yeah, it's a mile long or 1.5 kilometers. And he required all government workers to walk it once a year and encouraged all citizens to walk it once a year. Um, how long is it total? It was saying that there's, um, there's like two different paths. There's like a short one. There it is. Extremely grueling 23 mile one, or there's a five mile one. Which sounds, I mean, I love walking. I love hiking. I love cool trails. This looks miserable. I would hate it so much. And apparently there's like, um, like statues along it, like of Niazov encouraging you to keep going. Anyway, just a bizarre character. Looks like this is the football stadium. Of course, it's built out of white marble. And this is the Olympic stadium. They haven't hosted an Olympics, but it was for the Asian Indoor and Martial Arts Games. And we've got a horse race. The horses. They love their... He loves those horses. So another weird thing, this is Burdun Hamidov. But Niazov created Melon Day. And it's a holiday, August 18th, that celebrates the melons that are grown in Turkmenistan. And it's one of like the big... It's it's up there with like Nauru's and um, Eid al-Fitr. Like it's one of the big big holidays to celebrate these melons. 
which I'm off. Melon Day sounds awesome. I want to celebrate Melon Day. Independence Day, another big day. There's Earthquake Remembrance Day. It talks about up there. There's a list right here of different holidays. Uh, but yeah, I kind of went over all of them. He's got his melons. <laughs> I want to go to Melon Day. Sounds awesome. So this is like a really up close picture of a um, a tamdeer or like a, a tandoori oven baking bread in there. It's Melon Day, guys, and melons are free on Melon Day. And um, they're having lunch together. We've got some food, which that looks delicious. I love a good stew. Like a, it looks really thick and hearty. And watermelon jam, which looks just like cello. I'm all for that. And then a big picture of Turkmenistan. So you can kind of see just how flat most of the country is. There you go. All right. So that's it for the video tonight. I managed not to ramble too much, which is, that's a win for me. I'm proud of that. So yeah. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope you found this video relaxing and educational. I guarantee you, you learned something today. Go ahead and leave it in the comments. You definitely, don't deny it, you learned something today about Turkmenistan. Thank you again. Have a very good 